three miles below this formation of American flying fortresses, there lies Marienburg in East Prussia. Up to this moment, one of the most important cogs in Germany's war machine. The specific target on which this lead bombardier is lining up his bomb site is the Fokker Wolf 190 plant. Up to this instant, this aircraft factory has been accounting for almost 50% of Germany's total FW-190 fighter assembly. Bombs away. Tons of bombs rain down in a tight pattern of destruction. This, remember, is no area attack. It is an assault on one single target, and any bomb that falls outside that target has failed to achieve its purpose. The assembly of fighters in this Fokker Wolf factory has come to a sudden and violent end. To many, the bombing of Germany probably seems to be little more than a series of capricious adventures. One attack unconnected in any way with the one that preceded it or the one that will follow it. It is easy for the average citizen to envision the positions of ground armies because of maps like these, which make the positions of the contesting forces quite clear. It is harder to express so graphically the progress of a bombing program. Yet there is a real line in this battle of Germany, not a geographical front, but an industrial one. In the British Isles, there are the Allied air forces. On the European continent, we have Regensburg, Marienburg, Bremen, Horsesleben, Warnemunde, and Kassel. Everywhere there are plants and installations that contribute directly or indirectly to the making of German aircraft. Industrial bastions which must first be ripped apart before the enemy's armies can be destroyed. Now we come to the problem, how are the targets selected? And what enormous effort is necessary for the 10 or 15 minutes that our air task forces will be over any given target? The daylight bombing offensive against Germany is the responsibility of the 8th Air Force. Under the 8th Air Force are the 8th Bomber Command, the 8th Fighter Command, and the 8th Air Service Command, all of whom contribute to every bombing mission. But it is the Bomber Command which is charged with the actual destruction of the selected targets. Weather is the greatest single enemy of the 8th Bomber Command, for here is to be found the most changeable, treacherous weather in the world. To keep the most accurate possible check on weather conditions all over Europe, the RAF has established vast communication and reporting systems. Weather planes such as this Mosquito and our own B-17s are continually in the air in an effort to know in advance what the weather will be over Europe and the United Kingdom. Men like this supply a major portion of the data from which eight main weather maps of Europe and of the United Kingdom are drawn each day. In addition, there are four upper air maps and eight maps of a miscellaneous classification. In this room, all weather information is collected, coordinated by the RAF, and sent out by teletype to every responsible command. This is the weather section in the operations block at the Bomber Command. Here, the information gleaned from the weather stations is put together and correlated into weather maps. Accurate predictions must be made as to the direction and speed of the wind, downward and forward visibility, temperature, humidity, possible icing conditions, and probable atmospheric pressure at the bases, en route, and over the target. Upon the findings made in this room will depend whether or not there will be an American bombing of a German target tomorrow. This is the operations room of the Bomber Command. Here is where the wheels are put in motion for any American bombing attack. Right now, the officers you see are waiting for the commanding general's morning conference. They are the A3, or operations officer, the operational intelligence officer, a weather officer, and other members of the staff. What's the weather prospects today, Major? 
Looks like most of Germany will be pretty good, sir. But we have a warm front approaching from down here, which we do not expect to affect the bases until late in the evening. How's the weather at Anklam? At Anklam, sir, we expect two to five tenths of low cloud and small amounts of middle and high cloud above 18,000 feet. Visibility six to eight miles. How about Marienburg? At Marienburg, two to four tenths of low cloud, uh, little or no middle or high cloud, visibility six to eight miles. What will it be at Danzig and Gdynia? At Danzig and Gdynia, sir, two to five tenths of low cloud, two to four tenths of high cloud above 23,000 feet. Visibility in there about five miles. Give me the map of Anklam and the picture of the aircraft factory there. Yes, sir. All right, Marienburg, the Fox Wolf Factory. Yes, sir. We will attack Marienburg with two combat wings, Anklam with two combat wings, the shipyards of Danzig with two combat wings, and the port facilities of Gdynia with two combat wings. That will require a maximum effort. Now that the various specialist officers then go into action. This is the operational intelligence section. Here are target files containing complete information as to the type, construction, and vulnerability of the targets. This data is gathered both from photo interpretation of aerial pictures and from confidential ground sources. On the basis of this information, the aiming point for the attack will be selected. The aiming point is a building or installation in the approximate center of the target. Here, operational research experts are minutely studying the architectural and construction details of the targets. It will be their duty to recommend, on the basis of studies previously made, the types of bombs and the proper fusing to accomplish the greatest possible destruction of the objective. These studies of the Arado factory at Anklam are immensely important since the nose and tail fuses of a bomb can be adjusted to give varying degrees of delay between the time of initial impact and the explosion. For example, an improperly fused bomb would react something like this. Result, very superficial damage that may hardly even cause delay in production. On the other hand, here's what happens when a properly fused bomb strikes the same factory. Two bombs of exactly identical weight and explosive power have totally different effects because one was fused properly and the other was not. It is the responsibility of the operational research section to determine proper bomb fusing. Here the commanding general and the operations officer are working out the overall planning of each of the missions with the staff bombardier, the staff navigator, and the flak officer. This is a complex business because of the multiple nature of the attack. We'll attack Aklum one hour before we attack the other targets. That should draw most of the German fighters on the Aklum force. The Aklum force is big enough to take care of itself. You mean along the same course? Sir? No, uh, send them a little south. Uh, they'll act as a better diversion. This would be the best place across the coast from the standpoint of pilotage. But, sir, the... Uh Black concentration at that point is quite heavy, the heaviest along the coast. We could rather move them a little further south, where the general suggests, and they would not run into flak difficulties at that point. How is that for the navigation viewpoint? Well, that's a very good line for us, sir. All right, we'll cross at that point, and you adjust the flight times accordingly. Take care of it, Darrell. Yes. While this is going on, the various liaison officers stationed at Bomber Command Headquarters are busy keeping their respective commands acquainted with the course of events. The closest liaison is maintained with both the RAF Fighter and Bomber Commands, the Royal Navy, 
the 8th Fighter Command, and the 9th Bomber Command. It is through these liaison officers that requests will be made for the necessary fighter support, diversionary effort by the medium bombers, air sea rescue patrols, and so on. Officers at Fighter Command immediately look up plan number 2340 to find out what part the fighters are expected to play in the next day's operations. Similarly, the 9th Air Force is informed that Bomber Command intends to lay on plan number 2340. It will be the duty of the mediums to attack enemy airfields at a time that will cause maximum interference with German attempts to intercept the heavy bombers. Right now, weather officers are getting ready their forecast for the general's late afternoon conference where final decisions will be made. Yeah, sure. Should be okay. Thanks. Good night. Bye. Does your morning's forecast still hold? Yes, sir. There's practically no change in the situation, and we still expect the base weather to hold up for return. Send out the field order exactly as planned. Yes. Get me the first, second, and third divisions on a conference call, please. Already with your conference call. Go ahead, please. Can you scramble? Okay. Over. Okay, over. Over. Okay, there's a mission tomorrow. Maximum effort with five task forces. The first task force, comprising six groups of the first division, will hit 3948. 3948. Secondary, 8731. 8731. Last resort, 9009. 9009. The second task force, comprising five groups of the third division, will hit 6848. 6848. Secondary, 6424. 6424. Last resort, 5381. 5381. The third task force will comprise four groups of the second division, which will hit 6424. 6424. Secondary, 5381. 5381. Last resort, any industrial target of importance in Germany. Okay. The first and third divisions will each dispatch one air. The field order now goes over the teletype to all interested units and command. The first step has been taken in the sequence of events that will finally result in bringing our planes over the targets and discharging their bomb loads. Command has conceived the mission and laid out general plans and routes. Division now plans in detail what command has ordered. The actual time of assembly of the various task forces is determined. The combat wings are assigned to their specific task forces, and the routes from assembly to rendezvous points and the target are chartered. Many considerations go into the selection of the routes. Here is the commanding general of the first division, which you will remember has two targets for tomorrow, Hanklem and Gdynia. Control point here at zero hour. Another control point here for the northern unit, zero plus 40 minutes. Uh, the other friend from, there. From that, from that timing, where will that put our northern force at the time that our southern force hits the IP? Uh, the northern force should be about the east coast of Denmark at that time, sir. It looks like we're going to catch all the fighters on the southern force, aren't we? Looks very much that way, sir. I think we'd better bend that uh, route around so it's headed towards Berlin. If we can pin those uh, German fighters down in Berlin until we can get started home, they'll never catch us. At the second division, the target for tomorrow is Danzig. Danzig, eh? That's fine. How many ships will we have tomorrow? Well, sir, if you recall, General, on our last mission, we had heavy battle damage, and now all those aircraft are repaired yet. Call up the wing commanders and have them put pressure on the groups to get their maintenance crews to work on these ships tonight and get every possible airplane on the line in the morning. The third division, which will have for its targets Marienburg and Gdynia. Looks pretty good, sir. We're going to be right over a lake there for a good checkpoint of the turn. We're going in against the sun. The sun will be at our back, sir. Defenses at the target. Uh, Major Frost, uh, what about the flak defenses? Sir, the upper targets are 24 guns. That approach is good. The lower targets are 
it isn't defended by heavy guns. No heavy guns, whatever, Marienburg. Not so. The division's operations officer bases his precise plans on aircraft and crews available at the various groups. He then calls the combat wings to give them advance information before the field order actually arrives. Operator, give me uh, combat wing of the conference, please. This is operations of the combat wing, a purely tactical unit having absolutely no administrative functions whatsoever. How do you intend to make it? Sir, we'll assemble from all words. Problems of takeoff and assembly are the particular specialized function of this organization. It is the primary business of the combat wing to get the airplanes of its group into the air at the proper times and to get them assembled once in the air. Field order requires that we provide the second combat wing and the second air task force. 89th group will lead, 81st group will be high, and the 63rd group will be low. Uh, that means that Colonel Whitten will lead the combat wing on this mission? The Bomber Command has asked for a maximum effort. That means every available plane is to be gotten into the air. Uh, Ramsey, this field order has called for 3,100 gallons for the H's due to the distance. Now, they've called for maximum bomb load. How about that for the weight? I think we'd better put eight bombs in the H's and 12 in the D's. That keeps us around 65,000 pounds. How about the CG? CG is well forward, and I think it'll work out very well because we're down low for a long period of time. All right, we'll have eight in the H's and maximum in the D's. Combat wings must work out precisely the maximum bomb load in relation to the required gas load. Decisions made in this and other matters are added to the division's field order and passed on to the groups. The ultimate tactical unit to the men who get the planes in the air and fly the mission. On the basis of the alert telephone down to the group by the combat wing, the various agencies necessary to get the planes airborne on their mission wheel into action. Intelligence, operations, weather, signals, group navigators and bombardiers have the grave responsibility of passing on and making clear to the combat crews the vital target and route information furnished by Bomber Command and Bomb Division. The proper information folders, maps, weather maps and charts, and photographs have to be selected by the various group officers and then the information therein passed on to the crews. In dispersal areas, ground crews are getting their planes in condition to fly the mission. The normal work of keeping an airplane fit for operation is enormous, even in peacetime. When you add to this already great job, the element of battle damage, the problem becomes gigantic. Engines, wings, propellers, controls, wiring, fuel system, oxygen system, the thousand and one elements that go to make up the complex mechanics of a heavy bombardment plane all must be kept in perfect shape. The failure of any one of them on a mission can easily mean the loss of the plane and its personnel, or at best, such a failure will cause the plane to abort, that is, return to its base without having reached the target. It was originally estimated that about 37.5% of planes on hand would be effective at one time. However, the maintenance and repair has been so magnificently performed that sometimes up to 50% of planes on hand have been effective. Ordnance is already at work, getting the bombs in their racks and loading ammunition onto the plane. These are 100-pound incendiaries. These are 500-pound general-purpose bombs. And these are 1,000-pound GPs.
The bombs have to be placed in their racks very carefully. One bomb sticking in its rack through careless placement might make a whole mission useless so far as that individual plane goes. o'clock in the morning. All over England at this exact moment, American air crews are being roused from their sleep. Okay, fellas, roll out. We have a mission this morning. Rex in half an hour. Captain Kirk, Captain Thompson, Lieutenant Fuska, Ackerson, Alloway, and Hawker scheduled to fly. We'll snap it up. Through the cold of the English early morning, the combat crews go to their mess. They have no idea where they're going yet, but they know they'll be taking off in about four hours. thousand men who will go on this mission all know it will be a rugged deal. For some of them, it's their first mission. Others are veterans of many. Now, at all the groups in the bomber command, the air crews are assembling in the briefing rooms to learn the target for today. This is the briefing room of the 303rd group. Here in a few minutes, the nature, locale, and route of today's mission will be made known to the men who fly it. The target for the day is Ankman. Specifically, you are to destroy the Arado factory. At the 379th, the intelligent briefing continues. Late group will bomb from an altitude of 13,000 feet. We feel that this low altitude will be equalized by the element of surprise which is with us. At the 384th. Other forces are attacking submarine yards, aircraft assembly plants, and units of the German fleet at Danzig and Gdynia. It will show him that we will seek out his industry and destroy it wherever he places it. At the 351st, the intelligence briefing is completed. Your secondary target this morning is the air park <coughs> at Tutov. This contains a four-proof assembly plant, <coughs> a bombardier school, and you'll love this. It's the country club of the German Air Force. <laughs> Should you be on a... <laughs> A weather officer briefs the crews of the 305th group going to Gdynia. The synoptic situation today is this. We have a high pressure system centered over northwest Europe, up here near Finland, extending southwestward down across the British Isles, causing an influx of south and southwesterly air going up in this direction. A flak officer briefs the 389th group of the second division going to Danzig. Now, gentlemen, this morning, because we are going to cross the Danish coast at such a relatively low altitude, we've planned the route so as to avoid as much flak as possible. Now then, when you get to the target itself, your anti-aircraft fire from the ground will be known to be supported by fire from naval units. Now, for those of you who have never been fired on by a naval unit, I want to add that naval units can put up 
a hell of an intense barrage. And you want to look out for it. An operations officer briefs the crews of the 94th group of the 3rd Division. This group is leading a formation to Marionsburg today. The 88th will be high group and the 764th will be low group. At the 100th, the operations briefing is completed. The Royal Navy will be out patrolling with sea routes, so any crews that have to ditch will probably be rescued very quickly. The commanding general of Bomber Command has to put out a special effort today, so let's give it to him. The commanding officer of the group invariably has a few words to say. Men, the going's going to be rough. You're going to have to bow your neck in there and stay in there and pitch every minute. Now, gentlemen, this is the type of target you don't want to have to go back after the second time. Remember that your biggest enemy is still the single-engine fighter plane. Now, you bombardiers, take your time in going in on your releases. 